I guess that Karen's not here, but I do have to thank her for preparing everybody to listen to the Australian accent. So this is two Australians in a row. It must be some sort of record <coughs> conference, I guess, is it? Um, when actually, and I apologise for the title of my talk here, um, when I um, gave my title, I wasn't quite sure what session it was going to be in, so I have left it very fairly generic. But what I want to do here is um, essentially ask a question. And if I go to the... Um, what I wanted to, to if, if I pose the question that a lung aeration is the master controller for the physiological transition of birth, I wonder how many in the room would automatically assume then for, okay, what we're talking about here is increased oxygenation. Can I have a show of hands? Who would think that, immediately think that? Okay, right, so that, that's a good start. Because what, what I want to try and convince you is that it's actually a lot more than that. And, um, but let's, head to and, and look in, at the literature and really look at what the reported roles for increased oxygenation at birth. And, and, and in Australia, we would say, well, oxygen reportedly does everything under the sun. So it reportedly is responsible for the increase in heart, heart rate and cardiac output, the increase in pulmonary blood flow, closure of the ductus arteriosus, increase in metabolic activity, and more recently, stimulating um, breathing after birth. And where does this actually, a lot of this comes from? And really, I guess the best way to uh, introduce this is just to turn our attention to the neonatal resuscitation uh, textbook, the NRT. And all you have to do is, is turn to lesson one here and you'll see this diagram. Um, right, yeah. And this is actually a hand-drawn diagram of Geoffrey Dawes and it's actually from his book. And um, what you'll see here is the classic description of what the responses are to asphyxia. And he talks about primary apnea, gasping, and then secondary and terminal apnea. And he describes the heart rate response, and, and this is very well described, where you initiate asphyxia, the first thing you get is, apart from the apnea accompanying with that, is this vagal-induced bradycardia. And you get a suppression of the heart rate throughout this point until you uh, initiate resuscitation. And if you're initiating resuscitation, it's commonly assumed that uh, the increase in oxygenation here is responsible for this recovery in, in heart rate. And that's really the question that I want to pose today is, is it totally due to an increase in oxygenation? But nevertheless, this has actually led to the general concept that low heart rate at birth uh, equals perinatal asphyxia, and I really want to address that point, does it? Now, if we just dress our and turn our attention to the normograms that were published by Jennifer Dawson, and I guess this is where I sort of first drew my attention to this, uh, this, this concept. These are normal control infants that are normoxic at birth, and this is the normal heart rate pattern that you, that you see, and you can see that you know, at at one to two minutes of age, 50% of normal, normoxic infants have a heart rate, heart rate below 100, okay? The natural assumption being, therefore, from this is that these, things, these infants are asphyxic, but they're actually not asphyxic because they're normal control infants that wouldn't require any, any resuscitation or intervention at all. I actually asked Jennifer to show me some of the traces, and I've just put this one up as an example here. So, in blue, we have the heart rate response, and in red here is the oxygenation changes. If we blow up this area here, we can look at what's happening into the heart rate change here. And at the same time that oxygenation is actually going down, heart rate is increasing. So there's, there's this disconnect between um, increase in oxygenation and an increased heart rate, unless, in, in at least this um, uh, subject. Not to be outdone, we can show a similar type of thing in uh, ventilated preterm rabbits. So for those of you who are unfamiliar with these sort of tracings, so up here I've got airway pressure. This is a ventilated rabbit pup that's being ventilated at um, um, uh, using uh, intermittent positive pressure ventilation. Here's the tidal volume. We've got an ECG electrodes on these rabbit pups here, and so we're recording heart rate from the ECG. And as soon as you initiate uh, ventilation, 
we see after a little small lag in time as the lung aerates, there's an increase in heart rate here. Now that's classically what you would see in, a, in, a, um, in, a, in an inference as well that's requiring uh, ventilation at birth. But the odd thing here is that this rabbit pup was actually ventilated with 100% nitrogen. <laughs> so we're actually managing to achieve an increase in heart rate without any oxygen at birth. So what's happening? Well, what I believe is happening, I think what we've proved, is 100% um, nitrogen is stimulating an increase in formalin blood flow. So what we're really looking at here in this instance is, is simply there's a lack of preload uh, and when, when we increase pulmonary blood flow, we increase pre left ventricular uh, preload. I'm not going to talk about um, how 100% nitrogen can stimulate an increase in pulmonary blood flow in this talk, but if you want to ask me at the end, please feel, feel free to, to do so and I'll give you or try and give you an explanation as to what's the relationship there. So in essence, therefore, what I want to do is try and convince you this is not just about oxygen, this is also about, about pr providing preload for the um, left ventricle. And just to explain that concept further, so here is the, the newborn adult circulatory system, very simple compared to the fetus, um, where all re blood returning to the right side of the heart gets pumped through the lungs, and then all the uh, blood going through the lungs goes back to the heart, left side of the heart. So all of the preload for the left side of the heart comes from pulmonary blood flow. Now it's quite different in the fetus, where you have a placenta that's connected in parallel with the lower body, and the blood that's returning back to the right side of the heart, most of it actually goes through the ductus arteriosus. Uh, so therefore, we have very low blood flow going through the lungs. So the preload for the left side of the heart actually predominantly comes from um, the umbilical venous blood which flows through the foramen ovale directly into the left side of the heart. So what happens when you clamp the umbilical cord is you um, immediately lose the placenta or umbilical venous return as a source of preload for the left ventricle and as the lungs have an aerated um, as a result you immediately lose preload from the heart and here we've got a measure of um, uh, right ventricular output here and it plummets by around about 50% uh, as soon as you clamp the cord. So these are in lambs and not in humans. So then you aerate the lungs, increase pulmonary blood flow and uh, you get a dramatic increase in pulmonary blood flow and then uh, preload to the, to the uh, left side of the heart is uh, increased or I should say uh, restored. So this is about an intermittent period going from birth, clamping the umbilical cord to aeration of the lungs where you lose this preload and I believe that's the primary explanation for the um, uh, lower heart rate in those infants at birth. So just to reconfirm, so what we see here, you clamp the, cord, the umbilical cord, you get this decrease in heart rate which is restored after you ventilate and increase pulmonary blood flow. So simply the, the question therefore, okay, there is, well, what happens if you aerate the lungs first and you decrease pulmonary vascular resistance, allowing blood flow to increase before you clamp the cord? And if you do that, you get this very smooth transition. You minimise the decrease in heart rate and change in right ventricular output as a result. And in this instance, you, it gives you a much more stable um, transition to newborn life. So clearly those normograms um, will have to be changed if we start going towards um, delayed cord clamping or have to be re-examined I should say. So as I mentioned this normogram I would suggest to you for that particularly in these um, um, normoxic uh, infants that it's not so much hypoxia that is giving rise to the low heart rate it's poor venous return. So um, what then happens, okay, if we um, look at a, that's because they're in, in normal, uh, normoxic infants. So what happens in asphyxiated inf infants? So here in this instance, is it correct that it's increase in oxygenation uh, leading to this increase in heart rate? So what we, we started looking at this and so 
uh, what we're um, we started looking at asphyxia in the um, in preterm uh, in ter near term lambs, and what we found to start with is that the actual vagal bradycardia uh, response, the pattern, it depends whether you're in utero or ex utero when it when it um, uh, when it's in induced, and you see that the pattern is very different if the asphyxia is induced while you're ex utero. We subsequently showed that this has got to do with having water around the face. And so there is a perhaps a diving reflex which is impacting into the heart um, the vagal response here. We then resuscitated from that point here, looking at um, three different uh, scenarios. So uh, we used a 30 second sustained inflation, five by three second sustained inflation, predominantly because that's what some of the guidelines, particularly the European guidelines, suggest how you resuscitate asphyxic infants and we compare it to conventional ventilation. We are interested in looking at 30 second sustained inflations because it's much more efficient at aerating the lung. And lo and behold, if you look at the sustained inflation, 30, 30 second sustained inflation, the recovery from severe asphyxia bradycardia is much more rapid if you do a sustained inflation. What we were very interested to look at, and it or similarly, you see there's a huge difference here with the um, recovery in blood pressure as well. So what we're very interested in, in looking at this in more detail, and if you look at the actual heart rate response here, um, we're getting a response in heart rate, but after only four seconds of initiating sustained inflation, so this is really quite dramatic. And we thought, well, perhaps this is more about venous return because it's probably too quick to get an increase in oxygenation into the myocardium to stimulate um, the heart, the heart rate response. <coughs> so we um, uh, repeated these experiments using, again, using different um, blood gas, uh, different inspired oxygen levels, uh, using 100% nitrogen, 5% oxygen, 21% oxygen, and 100% oxygen. And the first point to note is, well, you do need a little bit of oxygen because 100% nitrogen actually didn't do anything. Okay, so it's, there is, a um, component of getting oxygen into the system. But the next point is that 5% oxygen is actually almost effective as 21% oxygen. And there was no difference between 21% oxygen and 100% oxygen. So definitely, I think what this shows is that resuscitation in se severely asphyxic um, um, bradycardic infants, that at least air is as good as 100% oxygen. So to finish with, so cardiopulmonary resuscitation at first, what's the role of oxygen versus restoring venous return? Well, in, in essence, I think it's just important to recognise that both are important, and it's a bit of an esoteric argument. What really is important is establishing pulmonary ventilation. Okay, thank you very much.